The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents No Neutrality, where we have a roundtable of contributors pushing the antithesis in every area of life. From family to government, apologetics to homeschooling, being a wife and a mother, a husband, a father, single, widow, business owner or employee, you will hear commentary, essays, lectures, blogs and battle plans on how to bring forth the Christian worldview to all of life. My subject is ecclesiastical megalomania. And uh, I thought I would begin somewhere that may be a surprise, but uh, there's a reason for this. Begin by talking about the Jesus movement, because that's where uh, some of my origins are. Uh, And in 1970, I was running a coffeehouse ministry. Uh, We had kids on drugs coming in and so on. We would have rock concerts there, and I would preach at them. And those were the days when... uh, Well, the Jesus movement, you know, I mean, it was the the Christian version of hippie kind of things going on. And uh, the ladies wore these long dresses, beautiful long dresses, touched the floor, and they kind of floated, you know, they didn't walk, they just floated from place to place. And there was a very popular church in those days called Calvary Chapel in Southern California, and they're they're all over the world now. They're not a denomination, but they're all over the world. And... um, there was a young woman who showed up at Calvary Chapel named Sandy. A uh, lovely blonde, she floated. And, um, and she would come in, she was reputed to be a prophetess. And she would come in and prophesy. And, and then she would sing a little bit, play on guitar, and then she would float back out. And we were all in awe of her. And one evening, very unexpectedly, she showed up at my coffee house, which was some, I don't know, 30 miles away. In Calvary Chapel, she showed up at this coffee house and uh, and came in and, and we all made made way for her and she came up to the stage and announced that she had some prophecies to lay on us and she did and then she sang and exhorted us with a few things and floated back out. We were all very impressed. A real prophetess of God had been in our midst and uh, we didn't really know what to make of this. But the next night she showed up again and then after a while she became a somewhat permanent presence there. You never knew when she was going to show up. It was like the spirit blowing where it listeth, you know, and that's the way she was. Well, one night she came in and, and delivered a prophecy, and then she took me aside. Now, I had never spoken to her directly. I was too much in awe. We all were. I mean, she was really somebody important. Everybody told us she was important, and all the important people in the Jesus movement uh, gave great deference to her, and so we didn't really know what to say. So nobody ever talked to her. She just came in, made, made prophecies, and went out. So she came up to me and said that she needed to talk to me personally. So she took me aside and informed me that God had told her that she and I were to be married. And uh, to me, this is something like the Virgin Mary telling you she's going to marry you, you know? Uh, Sandy was a lovely girl, you have to understand, but there was not a scintilla of lust in my heart for this woman. Um, I was too much in fear of her, and uh, so I didn't know what to say. Here's this woman I don't even know, and she tells me that we're going to get married. And, and so she looked at me expectantly, and so I said, but I don't know you. I don't love you. And she looked at me with infinite prophetic sadness in her eyes, and she said, oh, David. I'm so disappointed. Surely you know by now that you walk by faith and not by feeling. There was no answer to that one. So we walked back into the coffee house a few minutes later and announced our engagement. I was miserable, and the longer this relationship went on, the more miserable I got. And uh, I, I found out that she was very, very strange in a lot of ways, and I wanted to get away from this. And um, uh, I still didn't know her very well and, and hardly had conversations with her, but she, uh, she was now, you know, 
my matriarch or something. And, uh, but I kept putting this off and, and, so, uh, and discovering strange things about it. The thing was, nothing she said was ever tested. She said it, and it was the word, and we all submitted to it. And I began to feel that there was something wrong with this, but I didn't know how to oppose it exactly. And then uh, she was a little bit miffed at me that I was moving too slow on this. She kept wanting to set a date for the wedding, and I kept postponing it. And so, uh, so finally she said, David, we're going to have to really get this together immediately or just call the whole thing off. And I said, you know, I've been thinking the same thing. Let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> and that was the end of that, I thought. The thing was that for months afterwards, there were these uh, w what we called Christian houses. They were Christian communes presided over by uh, uh, an elder, a patriarch, who was maybe all of 19 years old. Um, who uh, he didn't have a job. Everybody else went out and worked, and then they came in and brought it to him, and he sat there meditating all day and, and uh, telling everybody to move to Oregon and things like that. And so uh, for months afterwards, elders of Christian houses were coming to me and telling me that I had disobeyed God in a very serious way, that I had rejected the Word of God, because this woman, Sandy, was the walking Word of God. She was infallible. What she said was the Word of God, and we could not question it. Um, she eventually pulled it on a couple of other guys, and one of them fell for it, and they got married. Uh, there was a, another young man in the same general movement, but, but he was actually in a group that was a little bit more tightly knit than ours was. Um, we became friends later, and, and he told me about the time when a friend of his in this assembly, this church that he was going to, which, which, by the way, declared itself to be the church. This was not just a church in the area, but it was the church. And uh, in fact, I had quite interesting discussions with some of their leaders as to whether any of the rest of us were in the body of Christ. And they, they had serious doubts about that. They knew they were, but they weren't sure about any of the rest of us because they were the church. And um, one of his friends, one of Greg's friends, got sick, uh, somebody else in the church. And so in order to help him out, he took some food over to his friend who had gotten sick. He was immediately pounced upon and disciplined by the elders of his assembly because he had not asked them for permission. No charity was allowed to be dispensed, sort of reminds of the Soviet Union, no charity was allowed to be dispensed unless it was through the elders of his church. You had to go to them for permission for everything. Uh, and this really is the whole issue of uh, what became known in charismatic circles and Jesus people circles as shepherding, the shepherding movement. And uh, one of the prime theologians behind this is Watchman Nee, and you can find these kinds of things in his writings where there's this real heavy top-down authority, every move that you make, every personal decision that you make, uh, certainly anything as important as, as moving from one place to another or anything like that or getting married, that all has to be a decision that comes down from the leadership. You aren't allowed to make decisions on your own. Well, coming into the Reformed faith for me was a great liberty and a release, and in particular coming into Reconstructionism, where I as I read through Institutes of Biblical Law, I found to my great delight that one of the most liberating verses in the Bible is 1 John 3, verse 4, sin is the transgression of the law. That may sound like bondage to some people, but it's not. It's the most liberating verse in the Bible or just about sin is the transgression of the law. That means sin isn't the transgression of anything else. It's only a transgression of the law. If the law says do this, then you shall do this. If the law says thou shalt not, then you shall not do that. But Apart from that, we aren't to make legislation for one another. And so I thought that coming into Reconstructionism and being surrounded by fellow Reconstructionists, we would all see things that way. Well, it didn't quite turn out that way. I was in a church in Southern California, a pastor of a church, and there was a young man in there uh, who, for lack of a better name, I'll call Craig. Um, and I watched him, his progress with some fascination because I realized that I was watching the birth and development 
of a heretic, a real one, on, on the level of, say, Roger Williams or something like that. I mean, this was somebody who could really potentially grow up to be a really great heretic, if he, if, at least if he, if he had the discipline to stick with it, which he didn't. Um, but he began, he, he, was, he was a quick study. He, he uh, read Rushdoony, lickety split. He read Van Til, lickety split. No serious weighing of these things, just real fast, picked up phrases and concepts very quickly. And reconstructionist phrases became the vehicle that he used in order to impose his personal uh, millennium on the rest of us. Uh, in fact, I, I got into an argument with one of his supporters at one point because uh, his supporter said to me, Craig is the voice of reconstruction in our time. And I said, no, he isn't. He's the voice of virtue, which in Otto Scott circles is about the dirtiest name you can call a fellow reconstructionist. Uh, but it was true. He was the voice of virtue. And he had plans for everybody. He had detailed plans as to what everybody should do with his money. Detailed plans about what to do with your children. And if you didn't do these things, uh, you were in sin. You could be disciplined. Uh, one of his principles was that, that Christian schools were inherently sinful. That, that a Christian school is wrong. That it's wrong to have a Christian school. It's abandoning your your responsibility as a parent to send your child to a Christian school because you should be educating them at home. He became a champion of home education. I believe in home education, okay? Let me just let you know, we, we homeschool our children, but it is a big leap in logic and ethics to go from there to say that if you don't homeschool, if you merely have a Christian school, that you're in sin. And he announced that, that people should be disciplined have church discipline come against them for the crime of sending their children to a Christian school. He, uh, he read somewhere, as I said, he was a quick study, not quick enough to think very long, but very quick and very articulate. And he read somewhere that, that um, women who are very active, uh, in particular uh, women who are uh, in the Olympics, runners and, and so on, that they tend not to have menstrual cramps. Now, what he left out was that they tend not to ovulate either, but, but he didn't think about that. They tend not to have menstrual cramps, or at least not as severe as other women. He concluded from that that the true Proverbs 31 woman would not have menstrual cramps. And therefore, if a woman has menstrual cramps, she is thereby demonstrating her laziness, that she's not active enough. Uh, you know, and, and it was really a doctrine of the week with this guy. You know, he would teach, he, his view of, of we, we got into serious conversations about this, that what our job is as Reconstructionists, as great Reconstructionist thinkers, and you've got to understand, he and I are both in our 20s at this point, okay? Great Reconstructionist thinkers, we are the cutting edge. Uh, even, he even sent a letter to Dr. Rush Dooney informing him that, um, that he may be over the hill a little bit, and we are, our little podunk, piddly little church in, you know, the biggest attraction, we would tell people where our church, where our city was, and they didn't know, and we said, near Disneyland. Oh, yes, okay. So, but our little church was, he said, the leading edge of Reconstructionism for the 20th century. It folded a couple of years later. Um, but uh, he was constantly coming up with brand new doctrines, and he said that he believed that it was our job to do this. Um, that if, if you are a Reconstructionist, you have to come up with something new and exciting, because that's what happens. We read Rush Dooney. We read Van Til. We find something on every page. There's, there's a new thought. I've never thought of this before. This is profound. And so what we have to do is sit around and try to think up profound thoughts, rather than having the discipline to study an issue and to look at it carefully, and to sift it and weigh it in terms of Scripture. And you can discover that you can actually have a profound thought or two after a great deal of studying and, and self-disciplined work through an issue, but he didn't want to do that. Uh, and in order to deal with him, I wasn't sure exactly how to do this, and he had some people in, in the church on his side, and and the, the church was beginning to split. And so we appealed to a Reconstructionist church in Texas. 
to the elders there to come out and help us with this. And so they came out, and they were a great deal of help, a great deal of help. And one of the things that they emphasized to us was something that they got from Dr. Rashtini's Institute of Biblical Law, and, uh, and they reminded us of this, and it was very important, and I'd like to read to you from this. This is from the first part of his discussion on the Third Commandment, the negativism of the law. And he points out that, that one of the things that people complain about, in fact, about biblical law is that, oh, it's so many, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, how negative. And Rashtini points out that this is actually a benefit of biblical law. And he says, a negative concept of law confers a double benefit. First, it is practical in that a negative concept of law deals realistically with a particular evil. It states, thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not bear false witness. A negative statement thus deals with a particular evil directly and plainly. It prohibits it, makes it illegal. The law thus has a modest function. The law is limited and therefore the state is limited. The law is limited, therefore the state is limited. The state, as the enforcing agency, is limited to dealing with evil, not controlling all men. In other words, even when dealing with, with very real problems in society, the biblical reflex is not to set up a regulatory government agency to oversee that area of life, rather to deal with the evil as it occurs, but not a regulatory agency. If, if there are problems in some area of the economy, uh, if there's fraud going on, the government should deal with the fraud. The government is not given a, a blank check by the, by the Word of God to simply regulate the economy as, as a whole. Second, and directly related to this first point, a negative concept of law ensures liberty. I'm putting from Rashini again. Except for the prohibited areas, all of man's life is beyond the law, and the law is of necessity indifferent to it. If the commandment says, thou shalt not steal, it means that the law can only govern theft. It cannot govern or control honestly acquired property. When the law prohibits blasphemy and false witness, it guarantees that all other forms of speech have their liberty. The negativity of the law is the preservation of the positive life and freedom of man. But if the law is positive in its function, and if the health of the people is the highest law, then the state has total jurisdiction to compel the total health of the people. The immediate consequence is a double penalty on the people. First, an omnicompetent state is positive and a totalitarian state results. Everything becomes a part of the state's jurisdiction because everything can potentially contribute to the health or the destruction of the people. Because the law is unlimited, the state is unlimited. It becomes the business of the state not to control evil, but to control all men. Basic to every totalitarian regime is a positive concept of the function of law. This means, second, that no area of liberty can exist for man. There is then no area of things indifferent, of actions, concerns, and thoughts which the state, the state cannot govern in the name of public health. To credit the state with the ability to minister to the general welfare, to govern for the general and total health of the people, is to assume an omnicompetent state, and to assume an all-competent state is to assume an incompetent people. The state then becomes a nursemaid to a citizenry whose basic character is childish and immature. And they reminded us of that powerfully. And this really stuck with me. I, I had already underlined it in triple get when I would read it the first time, but now I, I really saw in practice how important this was. And again, I was reminded of all, of all the tragedies that had happened in the Jesus movement. Now here we were again, supposedly reconstructionist people falling into this same trap again. And here was a positive uh, declaration from biblical law about how how God provided for this issue. And so I was very glad about this. This was liberating. And eventually, over the process of time, a few years later, I found myself moving to that same Reconstructionist church in Texas. It's hard for me to know where to begin exactly, uh, because there are so many issues, but let me start with, with this one. Rush Dooney has argued over the years that it is at least unwise. I'll, I'll be that mild about it. It's at least unwise for a church to run a Christian school. Um, he doesn't like the state running a Christian school, but he doesn't like the church running it either. The, the Christian school should be separate from church and state. And I saw how this worked out in this Reconstructionist church because something I had never thought of in that connection turned up, and that was this. Where the elders are running a Christian school, 
School policy of necessity is church policy. That is to say, if you disagree with school policy, you're not simply disagreeing with school policy. You're confronting Mother Church. You're disagreeing with the church. And this took on theological and even soteriological implications. Uh, disagreeing with school policy about, say, how to raise funds. Shall we have a bake sale or not? Well, if you don't want to have a bake sale or you disagree with having a bake sale or you'd rather do something else, but the church has spoken and said we shall have a bake sale, then suddenly that becomes a theological statement. To disagree with a bake sale suddenly takes on implications that you had not dreamed of. Um, and that became a problem. When people disagreed with, with school policy, they found themselves in trouble with the church over theological issues, that they were, they were in rebellion against the eldership. Another issue was going on. Uh, there was a widow in the church. Uh, you know, the church is supposed to care for widows and orphans, and reconstructionists in particular are concerned with caring for widows and orphans. And so this church decided to care for this particular widow. And she was, I guess, you'd, uh, I, most of us would consider her a little bit eccentric. She had quite a bit of money, and um, she had it in gold and silver and precious stones and things like that. And she didn't trust banks. She didn't want to have it in any banks. She had read enough newsletters about banks, so she didn't want to have anything to do with banks. So instead, uh, the elders of the church took her money for, or took her valuables for safekeeping. They stored her money, or her, her valuables, her wealth, so that she would not have to trust it to one of those unregenerate banks out there. And somehow that money just disappeared. The wealth disappeared. Uh, there were a few things, I think they, when, when she actually got around to demanding it back, she began to suspect things were going on. And she, she asked for it back from the elders, and they resisted giving it back, but eventually they gave her some, uh, they, they just apologized and said that, the, that it was gone. Uh, one explanation for this was that in order to help her out, she was this widow, here was this wealth that was just sitting there, static wealth, not producing, and so they invested it for her, and unfortunately, these things happened. Now, she had no idea that they were investing it for her. She had just given it to them for safekeeping, and this was in the tens of thousands of dollars. This was everything that the woman had, and uh, the, the money, the, the wealth was misappropriated. They, they eventually gave her a few rusty tools and things they scraped together, and that was all they gave her. Um, funds misappropriated. No one was ever held accountable for this. No one was ever held accountable for this. I'll come back to that. The, the elders, or at least some of the elders of the church, were running a business that, I mean, they were running this scam, actually. They were, they were running this, uh, but in connection with some of the deacons as well. Uh, there was one deacon's wife, um, very sweet woman, who was caught up in this and consumed with guilt over what had happened. And I don't get this from hearsay. I myself witnessed her in tears uncontrollably confessing to this widow what had happened. Very upset, very overcome. And the widow kept telling her, you know, it's not your fault. I know it's not your fault. It's okay. The deacon's wife couldn't stop crying. She was overcome with guilt. Eventually her marriage fell apart. A couple years ago she committed suicide. This corruption that was going on was covered up. Uh, Paul says to Timothy that the elders that sin are to be rebuked before all. 1 Timothy 5.20, but the elders of this church had a different doctrine. We heard from the pulpit something that, that really astonished me. The elders, one of the ministers of the church in particular, told people, told parents not ever to make the mistake of confessing wrong to their children. Don't ever confess that you did wrong. Don't say I'm sorry. Because that immediately lowers you in the estimation of your children. They won't have respect for you anymore. Now, I, as a parent, even of very young children at that point, 
knew better than that. Because I know that when you sin, you may not want to admit this to yourself, but when you sin, your children do see it. And when you bring down an unfair decision, let's say it's, it's happened that I have, uh, without finding out the facts enough ahead of time, I have uh, begun to discipline one child for something that really another child did, and finding out about it a little bit too late. What do I do then? And the elder said, don't admit that you were wrong. The trouble is the children know that you were wrong. And if you don't admit that you were wrong, they learn several lessons from that. One is that dad is basically a chicken. He's unable to face up to his own guilt. He's unable to fa face up to his own wrongdoing. Uh, this is not fair. I don't live in a system of justice in this home. And they need to see, I believe children need, since children know anyway that you're doing wrong, when you do confess wrongdoing, I don't mean you have to grovel in front of them, you know, don't lose your respect, but you gain respect when they see that you're under the same Lord that they are under. They're not simply under your discipline. You are together under a Lord, and, and God has structured things in the order of, of the government that he's ordained. You, the child is under the government of his parents, but both child and parent are under God's government. And they need to see that you are accountable to that. But we are told no parents aren't supposed to admit that, that you're wrong. And this feeds into a doctrine that they developed there uh, that became known as Father God, Mother Church. Father God, Mother Church. And the way it works is this. God is your father, the church is your mother. And how do you deal with things at home? Let's say that my children go to my wife and ask her for a snack. Can we have a cookie, a biscuit, I guess you say here. <laughs> uh, can we have some kind of a snack? And my wife says no. And I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, she doesn't really need to say no. They could have a little something, right? And so I disagree with my wife. Now my children come to me and they say, Papa, can we have a snack? And what the elders said, and this is true, at least I, I think so, you may disagree with me on this one, but I, I think they're right this far, okay, we can give them a little flack here, that you do not allow your children to play off one parent against another. Don't ever do that. That's a big mistake. And if my wife has told them no, even if I personally think that my wife could have made a wiser decision, I will back up my wife in front of the children. I will not undercut her authority just because I happen to disagree with her on something like that. So even though I think that she was wrong, I'll back her up. Father God, Mother Church. If Mother Church comes down with a decision to her children that is wrong, that is against what God's law says, God will back up Mother Church. Now, this sent a little bit of shockwaves through the church, as you can imagine, and people immediately came up with the obvious objection. What if, you know, let's take the extreme, the, the church commands you to say that sacrifice your children on an altar or something, you know, how far does this go? Does God always back up Mother Church? And they said, oh, of course not. Obviously, if the church ordered you as a member to sacrifice your children on an altar, that's not Mother Church anymore. Mother Church at that point has clearly become a harlot. And God will not back up the decisions of a harlot. And therefore, certainly, you, you disobey a decree of Mother Church if Mother Church commands you to do something that is inherently sinful and an abomination to God and so on. So, so we're not talking about that. We're talking about the day-to-day -day life of the church, where the church is commanding her children. The father will always back up Mother Church unless she is a harlot. That means, though, that if the church is wrong, if you say that the church is wrong enough for me to disobey this, you are calling the church a harlot. There has to be no mistake about that. If Father God will back up Mother Church unless she's a harlot, but if you say that Mother Church is wrong on an issue, it had better be an important enough issue because what you've just done in saying that Mother Church is wrong 
is that you called mom a harlot. Now, if you call my mom a harlot, you'll get in trouble. And that's what happened in Texas. Uh, one thing that seemed to get missed in, in some of this is that church members are not simply children of the church. Now, we are. If, if you are a member of a church, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you are a child of the church. You are. But that's a metaphor. And I, I ought to remind all of us that Jesus Christ himself is spoken of in Scripture as a child of the church. It's the church that gave birth to Jesus Christ. Isaiah talks about this, Isaiah 54. And uh, John talks about this in Revelation 12. Jesus is the, ch the son of of the church. That's a very powerful image in Scripture. Well, the church doesn't order Jesus around. And that's simply a metaphor. There are other metaphors. And church members are not only children of the church. We are the church. We are the church. And we shouldn't forget that. One of the things that, that was going on with this in, in the church was that we found... Um, that the elders of this church were very class conscious um, to the point where the pastor, not to the church. Let me, let me say that this, this church was not primarily built up from the community. That, that's how local churches usually are developed, that the gospel takes root in a society and the church is built up from local constituency. But that's not what went on in this church. People moved to come to this church. This was a Reconstructionist haven. And so they moved to come there. People at great cost to themselves. Uh, people gave up good jobs to get lesser paying jobs and so on. And the church had a fair number of rather poor people in the church. And the pastor of that church to other people outside the church called, he said that, that one of the problems that he had to deal with in his church was that there's so many white trash in the church. White trash. Uh, I don't know if you have that expression in England. I guess you don't, but uh, we do in America, and it's not particularly complimentary. Um, the sermons became increasingly mystical at this point. I would sit in church Sunday after Sunday and think, now let me think here. I have read Rush Dooney. I've read Van Till. I've read Joy Beard. I read John Owen, the Puritan, for bedtime reading, and J.I. Packer says that he's too ponderous to read. Um, you know, I may not be genius level, but I've got an intellect, and I'm sitting here. I, I'm rather well-read, probably more well-read than, than most members of the congregation, and I can't make head or tail of what this man is saying. I have no idea what he is talking about in the pulpit. And if I can't figure this out, how are these other people doing? Um, well, one way that the, the other people were coping with it was that they assumed that well, this has to be really hot stuff. This is profound. I can't understand it. I'm sitting here in awe and wonder at all these things that are being said from the pulpit. I don't understand it, but it must be true, and it must be very important. And this is life-changing, culture-transforming stuff. I'm right here on the inner circle. Nobody knew what he was talking about. Bizarre, I mean bizarre interpretations were coming forth from the pulpit. Um, and, and it was an interesting little game that was played with church history um, that, that it sort of cut on both sides. On the one hand, the congregation was given to understand that, that everything that was being said from the pulpit, that here we are, at the, the central point of the reconstruction of this country, of indeed the world. And the things that are coming forth from this pulpit, you won't hear anywhere else. One of the, one of the uh, ways of, of advertising uh, that you may have seen, uh, the, the, the tendency for at least some groups to advertise, we've got it, nobody else has got it. If you want it, you have to buy it from us uh, as, as one Reconstructionist writer put it, I want to save Western civilization at cost plus 10%, plus postage and handling. We've got it, nobody else has. I mean, my, my, I, I, uh, 
my, uh, there was a book of mine, well, two books actually advertised. Um, uh, a statement was made that there have been four really important books written since uh, Calvin's Institute. You may know of this. The four books are Rushdini's in Institutes, um, my book Paradise Restored, a great book. And uh, I think we would all acknowledge that it's right up there with Calvin and Rushdini, right, as far as cultural impact. <laughs> my commentary on Re Revelation, look, I like the book, I think it's a good book. You know, buy the book, Paradise Restored, great book, but let's get real, you know. Well, okay, wait, let me go on. There's Days of Vengeance. And then there's Ray Sutton's um, That You May Prosper, yes, That You May Prosper, which uh, I understand possibly a dozen people have actually read all the way through by now. Come on, admit it. People buy books because they think they're profound and they put them on their, they look through them and think, too heavy for me, but I know it's hot stuff and they put it on the shelf. Okay, now. Uh, w without getting pejorative about any of these books, let me just point out that yes, I do think that Dr. Rushdini's Institute of Biblical Law is important. I think it will be in print 300 years from now, not just as an antiquarian curiosity, but it is culture transforming. It is. Paradise Restored is a good book. Uh, it's a good book. It's a good book. Uh, you know, I said to the publisher, in fact, you have the most extraordinary luck of any publisher I've ever seen because you have never published a merely good book in your life. Every single book you publish is a unique classic in its field. You can't get anything like it anywhere else. You have to get this one. Days of Vengeance is a good commentary on Revelation. I think it's pretty good. I don't agree with all of it, <laughs> but it's a good commentary. It'll do till the next one comes along. And, um, uh, but you know, if you read some of the advertising about it, it's the only one worth getting. Now, if you read the footnotes, you find out that I actually did depend on numerous other sources for the insights that just sprang like Zeus from my head, you know. No, I, there, there are other... Uh, <laughs> and, but the, the problem is that there just happened to have been a few lightweights in between Calvin and the rest of us. You know, there were the Puritans. There were people like Warfield and uh, Thornwell and Dabney and Hodge and, you know, those lightweights. They, they don't deserve to be in our class, of course. Right below us, you know, Rushdini, Chilton. Chilton gets two books out of the four, you notice. And Sutton. Then below us, there are um, all these others. Well, uh, there, there was anyway this... this uh, mysticism coming out of the pulpit. Nobody really understood what was going on, but then sometimes it would not get mystical at all. And there was one memorable sermon uh, put forth by a deacon. I ought to point that out. This was said by a deacon. The deacon got up and he said, he was really the deacon of the church. There were other deacons, but this was the hammer. Um, and he announced at the beginning and gave a little exposition that the job of the deacon is only to do what the elders tell him to do. He has no discretion outside of what the elders tell him to do. Every word that comes out of his mouth, every action that he performs is in complete subservience to the elders. At that point, he launched into a talk about how the rest of us are to submit to the elders. We were given to understand, naturally, that everything that he said, he was saying on the direct authority of the elders of the church, because he had just said he can't say anything, he can't do anything apart from their direct command. So everything he said was coming from the elders, but it was coming through him, and this was playing it safe. You know, prime ministers and presidents do this sort of thing all the time. You know, uh, George Bush just did it with uh, the Civil Rights Act that he signed, but then he came up with some rules, but somebody else announced them, and then uh, the media objected to the rules, and so he backed up, no, I didn't really mean that, and so on. That kind of game is played. Well, it was played at this church as well. And so when people objected to this, the elders were able to say that they hadn't really meant any of this and that they weren't really apprised of what was going on when in fact it was exactly the opposite. But the statement was made that we are to submit to every whim of the church leadership. Even to disagree in our thoughts is an excommunicable offense. You catch yourself, you know, as they say in Cool Hand Luke, get your mind right, right? Get your mind right or you get locked up. Um, 
So every even we, we have to discipline our thoughts and bring that in line with what the elders said. And well, you know, may, if this has to do with questions like the Trinity, the Virgin Birth, what are we talking about here? And the deacon gave a very very concrete, you might say, rubber meets the road example. He talked about white wall tires. And he said that if you have white wall tires and an officer of the church comes over to your house and commands you to change them to black walls, you're required to do so. And any disobedience to that command is rebellion against authority, rebellion against God himself. And you can be excommunicated for that. Well, I thought this was interesting, and I went up to the deacon afterwards and um, gingerly asked him some questions. I pointed to a man in the congregation who was a policeman who was wearing his uniform. And I said, now, look, I know that if that policeman comes over to my house and tells me to get white wall tires, I will tell him, with all due respect, jump in a lake, because he, he doesn't have the authority to do that. He's exceeding his authority. And if I tell him to get lost, I'm not rebelling against authority. He is rebelling against authority, against his rightful authority. He is exceeding the law by coming over to me and telling me something to do that he has no right to tell me to do. So he's the rebel. I'm not the rebel if he is telling me to do something that he doesn't have the right to. So I said, does church authority, can, can you, is it possible for you to exceed your authority? Where, where's the line? Where, I want to know, at what point in my home can I draw a line and say, you can't cross that. You cross that line and we get into a little dust up here. So what, where's the line? And he, and he didn't answer that. He said, well, I'll tell you, you know, if, if you disagree with the, the decision of the elders, they tell you you get white wall tires, you disagree with that, you're at liberty to go around to other people in the church, find out if they disagree, and if you have enough people who disagree, you can kick out the elder. And I said, well, I got two problems with that. Uh, number one, gosh, does everything have to be that extreme? Can't we negotiate? Is it a choice of either completely submitting, letting this iron boot step on my face forever, or I overthrow the authority? Can we negotiate here? Can we talk? And he didn't say anything about that. He just smiled. And I said, okay, my second problem with that is that while I'm disagreeing, and while I'm going around the church, canvassing the church to find out who agrees with me and disagrees with the eldership, I am committing innumerable excommunicable offenses. Every time I think a thought against what the elders have said, I can be excommunicated for that, and certainly going around stirring up trouble saying, let's kick these guys out, I can be excommunicated for that, right? And he just smiled again. And I went all cold inside. I did. Um, it, it's a funny thing, you know, and I've heard people with some bravado, people later were, were kind of boasting about their attitude about the church, and they said, I would count it an honor and a privilege to be excommunicated from a church like that. Well, I, you know, maybe for you, you know, not in real life, not for me. I was not, I, I really had no desire to put my family through the trauma of an excommunication, even if I was convinced that it was a completely unjust excommunication. I still did not want to go through that. Um, and I would wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, terrified that I was going to be, be excommunicated for what I was thinking. Now, picture this. See, and at that point, there was this real uneasy relationship between me and them. I was not on the staff of the church at all, but I was, after all, David Chilton. And uh, I wasn't the most famous member of the church, but people did come to the church to find David Chilton, and I was one of the, you know, advertising gimmicks of that church, you know? And, and here I am going through these intense, gut-wrenching struggles over the issue of whether I'm going to be excommunicated simply because of disagreeing over a subject like white wall tires. But it got worse. Now, uh, there were people who disagreed with school policy. I mentioned school policy before. There was a school policy that was instituted that, that some people disagreed with, and it was a, a, a matter of, it had to do with fundraising. We're going to have our children go out into the neighborhood and collect 
money, collect uh, donations that you will, uh, uh, our children are going to run so many laps around the church. And will you contribute X amount of dollars or whatever? Uh, so every time I run a lap around the church, you'll, you'll throw in a quarter or you'll throw in a dollar or whatever. And uh, so they're supposed to go around the neighborhood doing that. Well, there were some people in the church and school who didn't like that. They said, I'll tell you what, you come to me and you ask me if the, if the school needs money, tell me how much you want me to give and I'll write you a check. But don't ask me to send my children around in the neighborhood collecting donations from heathens to build up this school. I, I don't feel like doing it. Now, they did not start a revolution. They didn't, you know, carry, they didn't picket, they didn't carry banners or anything. They just opted out. They stayed out of it. And so the, they didn't send the children around the neighborhood. And on the appointed day, they did not show up. Now, I was one of the ones who showed up. I didn't like it. I didn't feel comfortable about it. But we went along with it. I threw in some money for my kids and watched them go around the track. I think I maybe even went around the track once or twice. But <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so, but, but there were people who disagreed. They didn't make a big stink about it. They just disagreed. And uh, the result w of that was that they began being brought in and interrogated by, by the elders of the church and interrogating husbands and wives separately uh, uh, and uh, refusing to allow these proceedings to be tape recorded and everything. It was actually sometime before this, I had gone out to a bookstore and bought two books that I had read in high school and now was beginning to see the importance of. I bought by George Orwell, Animal Farm in 1984. <laughs> and, uh, and this really began to hit hard in 1984. Um, by 1985, I was sending out resumes very discreetly and quietly, begging and pleading anybody to accept me anywhere. I was willing to do anything to get me out of here. Um, and there was a real climate of fear. So much so that there was a family in our church who had moved about 20 miles away. And, uh, and they were, um, and our, our church there was very much into liturgy and, and so on. And that, that's not important here. I mean, I'm very much into liturgy too, okay? Uh, I have not abandoned that, but then I, actually my, my very first introduction to liturgy was, was given to me uh, when uh, Dr. Rushduni handed me a little book called The Book of Common Worship, which is a Presbyterian version of the Book of Common Prayer. And I began to study those forms of worship that were, it became really very meaningful to me. Um, but anyway, our church was in the liturgy. These people moved away, and there was an Episcopal church nearby. And they dropped in on that church, and they found that it was a very strong evangelical church, but it was a liturgical church. And they found also that the pastor was really, uh, that all the new books, they decided that they'd like to go to their church, and it was right around the corner from their new home. And so they applied for a transfer and got it. They got it. You can't imagine the shockwaves that went through the church at that point. I had people coming up to me, this, this guy who transferred out to another church in the area was a good friend of mine. I was probably his closest friend in the church. And here he was, he had transferred out. And people came up to me saying, I didn't know you could get out. <laughs> huh. See, at this point, there were something over 60 families in the church, and that one family moved out. And when people discovered that you could move out, people did so, and they started trickling out. And when that began to happen, that original couple was denounced from the pulpit um, in the most extreme terms, that they had left the faith, they weren't Christians anymore, and so on, and going to hell. But that began this exodus from the church, and the church dwindled down to a handful of families where it had had over 60 families. Um, now, something I ought to mention as well, lest you think that this is somehow unique. See, one reason why I began by talking about the Jesus movement, the charismatic movement, is to point out that this is not only in one particular section of the church. This can happen anywhere. This can happen anywhere. And it, in fact, is the case that, um, I, you know, I'm not mentioning names here, but, but I'll say that uh, perhaps the leading American theonomist, if I can distinguish that from Reconstruction, 
but the leading, the most important, the most erudite American theonomist was very strongly critical of the church there, and yet in his church he routinely excommunicated people for disagreeing with him, excommunicated people for leaving, excommunicated people for transferring to another church in the same denomination. Think about that. You're in a church and you transfer to another church in the same denomination and the pastor excommunicates you for that. Uh, so like I said, this kind of ecclesiastical megalomania can take place anywhere. Uh, in, in all fairness to that church, I, I should point out that although, like Rome, it has never apologized publicly for its abuses, um, those abuses don't seem to be going on there anymore. And they have, they've gotten into another denomination where there is oversight. And as far as I know, these kinds of abuses are not going on there now. Um, and the, what had been the eldership there, in fact, none of those people are elders there anymore. None of, none of the elders who were there when I was there are there anymore. Uh, there was a, a time when my wife and I were having dinner at the house of, of one of the elders, and over the issue of uh, what happened with the widow and some other things, this elder said to us, he talked about this, this one, this other elder who had moved away, let's call him, call him Elder B, had, uh, had uh, he hadn't moved away, he eventually did, but, but he had dropped out of the eldership. Actually, he had taken a leave of absence, and then uh, when, when political climates were right, he decided to come back in, and he tried to actually take his position again after this voluntary leave of absence, and he was prohibited from doing so. It was, it was really a comical thing. He wrote a letter to all the members of the church announcing that he was happy to come back into his position. And then the other elders wrote a letter to everybody in the church saying, disregard his letter. He's not in. And it was a real circus. But, uh, but one of the elders said to us that it's really ungrateful of Elder B to be doing what he's doing. Because when he was involved in corruption, we covered up for him. And now look what he's doing to us. Well, anyway, <clears throat> let me talk about some of the reasons for this megalomania and ecclesiastical tyranny. And I think these reasons, to some degree, point to some solutions for this. There is a need for genuine authority in the church. There really is. There are wimpy pastors and elders out there who do not lead. They do not govern. And there is a feeling among people that we need genuine moral authority and leadership. There's all this chaos in the church. Uh, there's a, a well-known church near me where uh, in, in the choir there was a well-known case that, that went on. Basically, everybody, at least everybody in, on the know in the church uh, knew about this, that one man was committing adultery with another man's wife. Both couples were in the choir. So Mr. A committing adultery with Mrs. B her husband, in order to get back at her, committed adultery with Mr. A's wife. And this was going on for some time in the choir, in the congregation. People knew about it. It was undisciplined. That same pastor recently, this, this is really fun, he, uh, he wrote, a, he wrote a, an article, uh, the Sacramento newspaper, uh, there are two newspapers, one of them carries a religion column. Uh, every Saturday it's in there, and this pastor wrote this wonderful, wonderful article on integrity, very well written, uh, made a lot of great points on integrity, the importance of integrity. A week later, the newspaper had a correction box, and they said, we, we regret to inform our readers that one of our readers drew this to our attention, that this article on integrity was lifted word for word out of a book by Charles Swindoll. <laughs> on integrity. Anyway, there is a need for genuine authority in the church, and, and that's part of what's going on here. People see this lack of authority and this lack of moral leadership, and they say something needs to be done, and that's one of the reasons. I mean, in part, it's a good motive for saying there needs to be authority in the church, and I agree with that. I think there does need to be the right kind of authority in the church. But one of the reasons for this kind of megalomania and, and the tyrannical results is 
that uh, they ignore the pitfalls as well as the good examples of church history, the historic church. I mean, when you consider that there were members of our church there who, in escaping from this church, fled to the relative freedom of the Roman Catholic Church. Think about this. Or, in fact, I myself saw Jay Adams nearly fall off his chair laughing when a refugee from the church in Texas told him that he had transferred to the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in order to find greater Catholicity. That's not funny here because you don't know the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, but I assure you that practically the last place on earth you will find Catholicity is the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and yet people transferred to the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in order to move toward greater Catholicity out of this church. But part of it is because it ignores the pitfalls of church history. We all tend to do this. There were the apostles, and there's us, basically. Well, that's, that's the more charismatic viewpoint. Or there are the apostles and Azusa Street, you know, 20th century. Uh, some of us will say, well, there were the apostles and J. Gresham Machen, or the, the great uh, reformers of you know, the 1920s and 30s. Uh, church history reaches back that far. That's about as far back as the Orthodox Presbyterian Church reaches back. And then there are others who, they're, well, there were the apostles, and then there's this Dark Ages, and finally there's Luther, or well, not even really Luther, but Cal well, not even really Calvin, but let's, you know, the, the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now that's where the church really takes off again. Um, and ignoring what has gone on in church history. Then you see this need for authority. You say, well, let's have apostles again. Let's have overseers. Let's have bishops. But neglecting the wisdom of the church and neglecting seeing what the church has done, what mistakes have gone on in the past, and how were they corrected? Why, why don't we learn from them? And there's very little patience with the subject of church history. There's also a neglected biblical law, and, and as I said, this liberating statement in the Bible that sin is a transgression of the law. There is an abandonment of the negative law principle. If you hold to biblical law, you must also, of necessity, hold to the principle of negative law. There are metaphors that the Bible uses for the law, and one of them is indeed the path. That we are to travel a straight and narrow path to follow Christ. And that's true. And from one perspective, the law is a path. But from another perspective, another equally valid perspective, the law can be seen as a boundary. Thou shalt not. And that's this boundary over there, this fence, this chasm that you must not cross. But everything inside there is Disneyland. I knew two guys, strangest thing, they had the same moral dilemma, but coming at it from two different points of view. One was a flaming charismatic, and the other was, a, you know, he thought a reconstructionist. The charismatic used to pray, honest, he really did this, he would get up every morning and pray for God to lead him which shirt to put, put on. Should he put on the blue one, should he put on the red one? He wanted God leading in this. The other one, oh, he, that was ridiculous praying for God to lead you as to which shirt to put on. How stupid. No, he said, and, and really it was over the same issue of shirts, <laughs> he wanted to deduce from biblical law which shirt he should put on. <laughs> you would be amazed at the reasons he came. He came up with this complex rationale as to which shirt he should put on on a particular day. Um, no, I said, you know, the law is a boundary. It's a boundary. There, we walk at liberty when we seek God's precepts. Psalm 119, we walk at liberty. There's liberty in the law. There's no conflict between law and liberty. If you think there is, you've got the wrong concept of law or the wrong concept of liberty or both. But in God's government, there is no conflict between law and liberty. They harmonize. God has called us to law. God has called us to liberty and freedom. God hates legalism. God hates legalism. But legalism has little or nothing to do with biblical law. To the extent that legalism has something to do with biblical law, biblical law is used as a smokescreen for radical injustice. 
Christ's conflict with the Pharisees was not that the Pharisees were upholding biblical law and Christ was upholding grace. Christ was constantly conflicting with them over biblical law itself. And he, he continually said to them, you are rejecting God's law, God's word, in order to keep your precious tradition. Um, another reason for this, for megalomania in, in the church, is what I think you can call a juridical rather than a pastoral model for elders. A juridical rather than a pastoral model for elders. Now, I want to hasten to say that elders are judges. Elders do form a court of appeals. And, and that's important, too, by the way. Elders form a court of appeals. We, we learned something in, in our experience with Presbyterianism, and we studied the Scripture to find out what is the biblical view of a presbytery or a larger court. And we discovered that the Bible knows nothing. This may come as a surprise to you, or maybe not. It, it was wonderfully enlightening to us. The Bible knows nothing of any kind of sitting presbytery that has nothing better to do than to hand down decisions to local churches that can't fight back. That's not the biblical concept of a presbytery or a synod or whatever you want to call it. The biblical concept of that is that it, it functions to the extent that it functions juridically. It functions at a, as a court of appeals. It's ad hoc. It's ad hoc. It, you know, let's get together if there's some kind of a problem that, that a local church doesn't know how to deal with and asks for help. Asks for help. Let's get the rest of them together and in a multitude of counselors there is not an infallibility, but there is at least wisdom. Uh, so elders are judges, but they're not primarily judges. Now, this comes into this whole thing of, of uh, shepherding. It was called shepherding in the charismatic movement. And that's a good word, perfectly good word, perfectly good concept if you've got the biblical one. Because the word pastor really means shepherd. That's what the word is. Pastor means shepherd. And if, if it helps, think of pastor related to pasture, okay? The pastor takes the flock into the pasture. Um, a pastor is a shepherd. That's what pastor means. But for one thing, pastors... Shepherds of congregations are under shepherds. We are under the chief shepherd. As with the parent and the child, both of them are under God's government. Same thing is true of the church. The pastor and his flock are both under the government of Jesus Christ. There is no absolute shepherding outside of Christ. Secondly, this matter of shepherding or pastoring is just a metaphor. It's just a metaphor, one of many that, that God has given to the church. The, the metaphor, that, that God has not given simply one metaphor for the church. There are many metaphors. One of them is the head and the body. And now we're not talking about pastors. Christ is the head, and we are the body. And the body has many members. The body has many gifts. And in fact, it is the weakest members of the body that should be most protected. Ask a football player. It's the weakest members of the body that are most protected. Um, why, did, why did God construct your body so that your liver and heart and kidneys are on the inside? Why couldn't they be dangling out on the outside for us all to see? Well, one reason, apart from aesthetics, <laughs> is they're inside the body, tucked away so that they won't get hurt. So they won't get hurt. You can bruise your knee or your elbow or something. It's not as serious as bruising your heart or your kidneys. And so they're inside the body. And there should be a concern in the church when you look at someone who is a particularly weak member, a particularly frail member of the church. Your response to that is not, let's call him before the session and interrogate him and show him where he's wrong. Rather, take care of him. That is the pastoral role. It's a, the body is one with gifts, and there is to be care for the weaker members. And in fact, the Bible does have a job description for shepherds, and I, I encourage you all to get into the biblical shepherding movement. There should be a shepherding movement. I wish there would be one in, in the church today. And uh, in fact, I wrote a letter, my last communique, <laughs> to uh, one of the elders of this church was simply, I read to, I, I typed out Ezekiel 34. And let me read to you part of Ezekiel 34. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. 
Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who are sick. Oh, i got to mention that. There's a wonderful doctrine of healing in this church. We believed in healing, anointing for healing. It was great. Um, and, and I believe in that. We, when somebody's sick in our church, we, have, we, we make house calls, for one thing. But on some occasions, we actually have the person come up voluntarily, come up in front of the church, and we pray for them, lay hands on them, anoint them with oil, pray for them to be healed. There's nothing magical about it. Uh, some people are not healed. Some people are. Sometimes it's been very dramatic, sometimes not. But we pray and ask God to heal them. That's all we can do. We're commanded as elders to do that. In this church, there was a real interesting doctrine that Paul prayed three times for God to take away his thorn in the flesh, and God didn't take it away. And so from that, they deduced that you can only pr pray three times for God to take something away. You can only have the elders pray three times. And, and if it doesn't happen after those three times, you can never come up again. Um, there's an interesting, thinking economically, somebody should have realized this, that if you're granted three wishes, you will ponder forever over what that first wish will be. You really will. You won't immediately wish for a million dollars because later you'll think, I could add two million. <laughs> a billion. What am I, you know, confining myself for here? Um, I wish I had more wishes. <laughs> uh, you could do all kinds of things. So just hold off a minute. And, uh, and so the result of this was that people, there, there was a man there with, with a very serious illness that he really needed prayer for and wanted prayer for. He never came forward. He was always afraid to use up any of his wishes, so he never came forward. And there was, a nut, there was a doctrine in that church that we will not come to you. We will not seek you out. If I see that you're sick, I will not call you up and say, let me come over and pray for you, brother, to be healed. No, no, no. You have to request it. Now, there's some logic in that. We do find that in most cases, not all, but in most cases where Jesus healed somebody, the person asked for it. And I think there is something psychologically important in asking for prayer. But there's nothing ironclad about it, and certainly a shepherd of a flock can tend to the wounded and the weak in his congregation. Let me go on. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there were no shepherd, and they went to the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church and the Re Reformed Presbyterian Church and the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and the Charismatic Church and the Evangelical Baptist Church. My flock, um, they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered, and boy, did that happen. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. And it goes on and on. The rest of the chapter is a gem. I just read the first few verses. Um, Jerem Bars wrote a little book called Freedom and Discipleship. It's not available in the United States, but it may still be available here. It was published here. Uh, your Church and Your Personal Decisions. And he discusses this whole issue. And it really is a, a helpful book, and I just wanted to quote one thing out of it. The first responsibility of an elder is to be an example of godly living, rather than being an inaccessible preacher whose task is primarily to deliver sermons to the congregation. And by the way, that is a very great temptation. I, as a pastor, speak to that. That speaks to me. I would much rather simply deliver the words of authority and wisdom and then retreat back to my study than actually have to deal with people. But that's the job of the pastor. So rather than being an inaccessible preacher whose task is primarily to deliver sermons to the congregation, all elders are called to practice hospitality and to be servants of the flock in a practical way. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, 1 Thessalonians 2.8. The overseer must be above reproach, 1 Timothy 3.2, not lording it over those entrusted to you, 1 Peter 5.3. Jesus remained a servant, washing feet, until the end of his earthly ministry. No leader ever moves beyond being called to be a servant of the flock. Uh, a, a final reason, I think, for this kind of megalomania and tyranny is a practical distrust of the Holy Spirit's sanctifying work in the body. Jesus promised in his long discourse 
just before he went to the cross. And John, he promised over and over again the Holy Spirit's presence in the church. This is not something fitful or sporadic. This is an enduring presence. In fact, the whole Trinity takes up residence in the church. My Father and I will come to you, he said, through the Holy Spirit. Jesus talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in the world. The Spirit will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Let's not ever make the mistake of thinking that the Spirit just sort of floats around the world convicting people willy-nilly. He doesn't do it that way. The whole point of that discourse is the Holy Spirit does not do that by himself as such. The Holy Spirit is given to the church. And the Holy Spirit has a renewing and sanctifying work in the church and among the members of the body. And when we see somebody getting into a little bit of trouble, we can give them advice, we can give them, give them encouragement, we can trust in the work of the Holy Spirit in that person. We don't immediately have to bring authority crashing down on his head over some problem that he gets into. We can give people space, back off, realize that nobody is ever static. Nobody ever stays the same. Nobody ever stays the same. They may look stuck for a little while, but they are not stuck. They move. They move through time. They move through history. And they change. And they either move toward Christ or away from him. And you can give people a chance. And if somebody really is an ungodly, wicked rebel against God, that will show up in his life. You don't have to pounce on him right away. And on the other hand, you can trust in the work of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ to renew and give life to the body. I think that we all have temptations to be as God. At least I do. I don't know. Maybe not all of you do. But I do. I have temptations to be as God. Um, and I think I can point to instances in my own life in my own present ministry where I've been too harsh on people. There have been some people who have left my church uh, every once in a while. Somebody gets upset and leaves. And sometimes I'm successful in calling them back, and sometimes I'm not. And I think that there have been at least one or two instances where I could have been uh, gentler with a member of the flock. It happens to all of us. There's a temptation to all of us to be as God and to lord it over the flock. It's something we have to war against at all times. And in connection with that, let me point out, right, see, I, I can sound very wise and noble in all the things I've said. I want to really enforce to you that everything good that I've said tonight, everything good that I've said tonight, I learned in Texas because it was all said there too. They began by talking about negative law and the importance of negative law. And after a time, one of the elders said to me, oh, we don't believe in that concept anymore. But that's where they began. And this can happen to any of us. Um, uh, I, I don't mean that it's going to suddenly spring, spring up in the middle of the night and bite you on the neck. I mean that there are tendencies, and we have to guard ourselves against those tendencies. Well, anyway, I'm done, and we can have a little bit of questions. <laughs> uh, sorry, I should have given more time for that, but I wanted to make sure I made myself clear. Yes. Yes, yes, I, I should make that point. And just in case, that probably did not make it onto the tape. So Dr. Rushdie reminded us all that apart from three rogue churches, the Reconstructionist churches in America are not characterized by this kind of thing. And that, but yes, that's true. I, I don't mean to cast aspersions on everybody. Um, uh, so, but, but on the other hand, I didn't simply want this to be just sort of juicy gossip on some particular group. I, you know, the principles here are important, not just for us to sit around and listen to what somebody else did, but, but, but to, to point out that this is a danger. It has occurred at various points throughout church history. There have been sects and groups that have gotten into this sort of thing, and they fade away and, and are not particularly important anymore except as footnotes. Are there any questions? Yes.
I think that, that people can enjoy power and prestige. And, you know, there, there are people who get into the ministry because of the supposed prestige it's going to give them. Um, uh, I, I've known people who are dying to write books, not because they have something important to share, but because they want to have been an author. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that kind of th thing can happen. Um, uh, as, I, as I said, that there can be this tendency to have contempt for the people that you're ministering to, that they really aren't up to your level, they aren't in your class or whatever. And, um, uh, and that was occurring there. And it does occur other places. It, uh, I do see that people get this idea of power. Uh, I, I can't remember. I teach a, a course through Rush Dooney's Institutes, but it's big, you know. And I can't remember exactly where he talks about this, but, but there's somewhere we spent quite a while on this point where he talks about the, the abuses of power. And on the one hand, there, there's a kind of abuse of power where people uh, grab for, for more power and authority than they're supposed to have, and they lord it over people. And on the other hand, there is the kind of abuse of power which is not to use rightful power at all, and, and where people are too weak. And, uh, but then there is this seesaw kind of effect that goes on, or the way uh, Francis Schaeffer once described it is that if, if we say that all truth is on a scale of 1 to 100, and the church is, say, minimizing points 40 to 50, or at least somebody thinks they are, and so they immediately start agitating for, for more 40 to 50 in the church, and the church begins to react against this and shuts them down, and so the 40 to 50 people move out, and they start a points 40 to 50 church, and the trouble is that, that those points 40 to 50, instead of having their rightful place in the whole corpus, they be, those points 40 to 50 become that church's points 1 to 100. Then the church over here missing points 40 to 50 say, see, we told you so. We don't want to be like those people. You know? And so there's this you know, dead orthodoxy on the one hand and, and lively heresy on the other, and just ricochets back and forth. Um, and so there is a tendency... Uh, Schaefer pointed this out too. I, I don't think... It may, it may have been the same thing. He points this out in his little booklet, The New Super Spirituality, where you had young people in the Jesus movement who had grown up in oppressive fundamentalist churches that said, that prescribed a divine hemline and, and said, or hemline and said that, uh, that women shouldn't wear earrings or lipstick or, you know, that they couldn't do this. It was, Christianity was this big bunch of do's and don'ts that really didn't come from the Bible. It just was cultural, and you can't watch television or whatever. And so they rebelled against that, and they wanted the freedom of the Spirit, and they wound up in these very exclusive little communes that regimented every moment of their waking life. Um, and so they run from one kind of tyranny into the arms of another. And, and we have to be on guard not only against... Um, statist kind of tyranny, but ecclesiastical tyranny as well. It happens. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Womb to tomb care. Uh, completely paternalistic attitude toward the people. A a in that in that quotation that I read, uh, let me just give that part of it again. The state becomes a nursemaid to a citizenry whose basic character is childish and immature. You don't give people responsibility. You don't trust. When, when we don't trust our own children, if, if you forever held your child's hand walking across the street, even when he's you know graduated from university, you're still holding his hand, he will never be able to be trusted across the street safely. He's always depending on someone else. And that's what these churches tend to do. They, they create a passive constituency that simply does what they're told to do. And it happens in a socialistic state and in a socialistic church. Yes? Yes. Uh, there, there was this fear about that. Actually, it, it was interesting in the way it turned out, because uh, 
Dr. Rashini is very open with with that that news team, and so was I. Uh, the producers there, they came and stayed at our home for a few days, and whoop, and we all got along real well. I, I gave them names, addresses, and phone numbers of people who disagree with us, and said, you need to call them and find out what they're saying. Go ahead. I was completely free and open with them. And so they had come expecting a real fortress mentality. Instead, they get this openness and freedom, and we're handing them literature. Please find out about what we're saying. And then they came to a group in Tyler, Texas, who refused to talk to them. They, got, they were met with closed doors and secrecy and hiding away, people running behind walls. And, and so it actually worked out kind of well for the rest of us, I guess, because what, what they wound up with was the notion that Oh, Reconstructionism itself isn't characterized by this kind of mentality. It's only some particular sect of them that is. But, but as a whole, they're rather nice, open, free kind of people, and they may have a point here. See, I was worried about that series because the, the, the week before, they had done a, a, a program on the Southern Baptists, the fight among the Southern Baptists over uh, the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture. And the point was actually made on the program, uh, not exactly in these words, but the definite impression was left with you that the doctrine of biblical infallibility was a right-wing plot hatched in Reagan's White House to keep the Republican Party in power. And that that was really what was going on in the struggle among the Southern Baptists over the, the conservatives and the so-called moderates. And when I saw that, I thought, oh no, if they did that to them, these poor Southern Baptists, what are they going to do to us? We don't even, for us, we don't argue about infallibility of Scripture. We assume it. That's where we begin. So we begin at, at that point, at the point that they regard as this horribly knee-jerk, reactionary, uh, right-wing republicanism. And, uh, and so I, I was really worried that they were really going to do a hazard job on us. And in fact, it was, I was rather pleased with it on, on the whole. Um, they they uh, cut out about eight hours worth of things that I said. Um, and actually some newsletters were sent out from, from certain very worried quarters about that because they found out that there was a lot of tape. But I had said a lot of things and they were wondering what I, what, you know, what got away <laughs> and, and what's still reserved in the files and it wasn't all that <laughs> explosive or anything, but they were worried about it. Um, so it, it, was, it was a good time, but, but they did come to us expecting that we would be afraid of them and that we would turn them away and that we had something to hide. Instead, we just deluge them with material, which, which is sometimes a good idea to do. Um, you know, somebody, want, somebody that may be a little bit hostile wants to find out something, give them everything you've got. They can never have the time to read it all. <laughs> just give them everything. And, uh, and after all, uh, this is, if it's Christianity, right? If it's Christianity, this is about the gospel. This is about, uh, you know, Paul says we don't have anything to hide. These aren't things that are said in secret. This is open before everybody. Um, we are sharing the wisdom of God with the whole world. This is something we invite the whole world to come. We expect the whole world to come into the kingdom. And so we don't have any reason to hide what we're saying. Um, there's no secret hidden doctrine. There's no secret agenda somewhere. We're just proclaiming the truth of God's word. And if, if you come at it from that viewpoint, uh, they still may not like what you're saying, which at points Moyers clearly didn't like. But uh, but but suddenly it was there was no more worry about you know uh, we're sort of Christian ayatollahs or something like that. But And I, I should say, too, that the reputation of what had happened at this church did get around the country, and that was one reason why, why people on the outside thought that that's the way everybody was, was because of these kind of things happening. Yes? I think, I think it, it eventually becomes too top-heavy and, and falls, of course. You know, other tyrannies can take their place. I mean, the the fact that uh, that you know, there was no more gold head meant there was a uh, silver 
arms and chest, and then later bronze belly and thighs and iron legs. So one tyranny can be replaced by another one. Um, but all tyrannies are overcome ultimately by the kingdom of Christ. And in particular, in church, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave the church. The Holy Spirit has to wrestle with us quite a bit and um, has to beat some of us up, but the Holy Spirit does not leave the church. He works with the church, and he eventually overcomes us and subdues us to Christ. There is that other extreme of not going to church at all. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that that is a, a very sad thing. Um, um, I was uh, talking to, to somebody recently about this, but it, it is odd sometimes that you find people who are very committed Christians have withdrawn from churches altogether. And on the other hand, people who don't seem to know much of anything about Christianity can be very dedicated to going to church. And, and that is sad. I, I think that uh, the 20th century is one of great disarray in this, and I believe that the Holy Spirit is pulling people together. But, but in part as a result of the kind of tyranny that, that goes on, I know people who were in that church. Uh, I mean, I already m mentioned the woman who committed suicide, but there are many examples of just flotsam and jetsam floating around out there, uh, burned out former members of that church whose lives to this day are, are uh, greatly scarred by their experience there, some of whom don't want to have anything to do with the church at all. And that's sad, and I blame it on the leadership. Uh, obviously, the people themselves have a certain responsibility for that, but God himself, in, in Ezekiel 34, blames the shepherds when the sheep wander. And, and we do have many wandering sheep, and uh, if you're one of them, I, I encourage you to find a home, find a fold somewhere, and get in it and be a faithful member. But the leadership is responsible for, for the, the shepherds themselves that have scattered the flock. And God says that he does not leave his church alone. He is the shepherd of his church, and he says that he will raise up shepherds for his church. There are shepherds out there. Uh, The individuals do have responsibility too. That's right, and and unfortunately, yeah, I, I think that the leadership has a greater responsibility. Yeah. For church membership, faith in Christ. That's all. Um, oh well, yeah. Uh, I thought you meant for admission to membership. Uh, yeah, I, I do believe that, that attendance. Yeah, yeah. There, there, sh there should be uh, commitments in in um, in your attendance to the church, in your giving to the church, and so on. Um, and we we talk about that when people come to our church and and apply for membership. We talk about the commitment that this means that there this is not just some place to come. That they are um, expected to be there in the Lord's house particularly on the Lord's Day. Uh, we have Bible studies and other things that meet during the week, but they're, they're not um, on the level of worship on the Lord's Day. We do believe that, that worship on the Lord's Day is important. Um, we don't have a Sabbatarian attitude about it, but, um, but we do believe that it's important to be there. And, and we let them know that that is their responsibility, unless providentially they're hindered by some other reason. Um, there are people who, at various times, want us to sort of certify their membership. They want to be members of our church, but they don't want to attend. Um, and sometimes this is because they live, they live some distance. What, what we don't like about that is we encourage people to join a church where you are and give up looking for a perfect church. And, and if you're looking for that, please do not come to ours. Um, we encourage people to stay away if, we, if there's any hint that there's... We really do. I've told many people not to come. Don't come to our church. Um, but that you join a church where you are, and it may not be everything that you want it to be, uh, but join the church anyway and work in it and, and do your best. And if, if there is just no suitable church anywhere, do your best to move. But, but 
it doesn't seem to me that the New Testament knows anything of a Christian who's not a member of the church. And I don't mean that simply in an institutional sense. I think that in the institutional sense, yes, but it's really much more than that. I'm talking about being part of the life of the church, um, being a real active member, sharing your gifts. When people uh, come into our church, we were just talking about this, that we need to make this more clear, that um, to ask people, what is your gift? Find out, what are, what are you doing in this church? Why are you here? God has you here for a reason, and we expect you to be a real contributing member, not simply in money, but in the gifts that God has given you. Yes? Oh, that's true. That's true. Find another church. <laughs> Yeah. Although it, it might do some, yeah, it might do some good if you gently rock the boat a little bit. Uh, uh, I think in a lot of cases, not all cases, but in a lot of cases, you can have a positive effect in the church without being branded as a schismatic. I, I think it is possible to do that. I have, I have seen, case, not all cases, okay, so I don't mean to brand everybody with this, but I have seen people who have said, oh, that church kicked me out because of my stand for the truth. Well, it, sometimes it's how you're standing for truth. You know, Standing up in the middle of the church service and calling the pastor heretic is probably not the way to do it. But I've seen people do that. And there was a man who came to our church who was full of all these stories about all these tragedies that hap had happened to him in another church because he was standing for the truth. He was just a troublemaker. He was using certain truths as a smokescreen for what he wanted to do, for his own um, megalomania that he was developing. Um, and I think that, that if you are serving people, you're serving, if you're dedicated to um, caring for one another. I, I remember one, one time uh, uh, when... Uh, Dr. Rushdini spoke at a church, and they were very uh, active in in doing things, giving money to causes elsewhere, you know. And so Dr. Rushdini said, "What you need to do is not simply, you know, give money to somebody far away, but look at the needs in your own congregation. Are there elderly people who need somebody to go shopping for them, or need somebody to read to them, or need some help around the home? Maybe you can." fix the appliances that are falling apart, something like that. You can dust, you can clean. This isn't very glorious work for reconstructionists to do. I know that we're all, we'd all rather talk about epistemological self-consciousness, but sometimes you can actually engage in a little bit of foot washing here, and that can, can do a lot of good. And, and so, so Dr. Rashini pointed out actual cases in that church that needed somebody to do something for them. And this caused a great deal of excitement among this congregation. They said, let's form a committee to study the problem. And his point to them was, no, you don't form a committee. Just do it. Just do it. Jesus didn't say in Matthew 25 that the committee that gives to those who are hungry, that feeds the hungry, the committee that feeds the naked, that, that clothes the naked, and so on, the committee that goes and visits people who need visiting, he didn't talk about that. He said, you. You do it. God holds us responsible to do those kind of things. And Jesus said, the Son of Man, as the example to everyone else, the Son of Man, I mean, this is in, in the context of the disciples thinking about the Son of Man ascending to power and glory and dominion in the kingdom over all peoples, nations, tongues, everyone on earth. Daniel 7, 13, 14, they were real excited. Here they were on the ground floor of this administration that was going to take over the whole world. And so they were, they were arguing among themselves as to who got to sit where. What is the seating arrangement at the victory banquet? And Jesus said, the Son of Man, don't be like the Gentiles who like to lord it over others. The Son of Man himself came not to, minister, not to be ministered unto, but to minister unto others and to give his life a ransom for many. And that is the pattern for our behavior as well. Jesus pointed to acts of service in our part. I, I think in many cases, certainly not all, but in many cases, if you get into a local church, I don't mean, you know, first apostate church. I mean a church 
regardless of which problems, you get into a local church and begin to serve, you'll make a difference in that church. Find a good church to do that in. But yes. John MacArthur's church. I, I don't know a whole lot about the church. So I, I mean, I guess I know some things, so it depends on, on what you're talking about in particular. Thank you for listening to this episode of No Neutrality on the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network. Don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to download your favorite audiobooks and podcasts. And if you are a Christian Reconstructionist blogger and you'd like to contribute your blogs into this audio blog format, click on the volunteer link on our website, send us an email, and let us know you'd like to join the team. May Christ be glorified and His kingdom extended from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.